Please stand and face the rear of the church. Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Spirit. Amen. You make known to me the path of life. In your Christ has been raised from the dead. The first of us fallen asleep. Because of Jesus' victory, God has offered us the forgiveness of sins. So confess your sins to him and experience his mercy and peace. Please kneel with me. Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins. He has died, but he is risen. And by the grace of God, 
you are forgiven. Please stand. first reading this morning is our sermon text from Isaiah 25, where Isaiah receives this message. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, a veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from the resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul makes the case that indeed the resurrection isn't a spiritual resurrection, but a physical one. 
Now I'll remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel today is from the gospel of Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And they, he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We invite the children to come forward during the next choir anthem and to put a, a flower on the cross. <laughs>
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We have every reason to say hallelujah about something like that. And today I want to impress upon you again what an important thing has already happened and how very important it is to you. You who've been blessed with hindsight into the death and resurrection of Jesus and who have been reached out to by the Holy Spirit that you might believe. Our text today is from Isaiah. And if you don't know Isaiah, he was like 600 years before Jesus. And he's a prophet, of course, and he receives a message from God. And it starts again like this. He says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts. And it goes on to say what the Lord of hosts will do on this mountain. What mountain is this? It doesn't really say, but you don't have to be a genius to figure out. It's the mountains that Jerusalem is built upon. Isaiah must have been there in Jerusalem. Now, I've been to Jerusalem, and I'll be honest, when I was there, I didn't necessarily have the feeling that I was on a mountain, but it's sort of on a, a ridge, and it's got four peaks that are noted to make up the city. And then, of course, then there's one little rocky outcropping that's very significant. It's not that big. It's really not any taller than, than the floor to maybe, well, maybe the balcony. Not any bigger than that. On that rocky outcropping, Jesus Christ was crucified. On that rocky outcropping, Jesus won for us eternal life. Isaiah, even though he's a prophet, he, he had the Holy Spirit, but he didn't have any hindsight. And so I doubt very much as he spoke the words that he really knew exactly what he was talking about. And he had to ponder in his own heart what that whole passage meant and what it would mean for him. And he would have to wait 600 years, well after his death, to see the fulfillment of this. And a lot of people, you know, they had the honor of seeing the events around Jesus' death with their own eyes. But what they didn't have right away was insight or hindsight into what it all meant. Think about the women, or for that matter, the men, who went out to see the empty tomb. These people had been told in various ways well before Jesus was crucified that Jesus is going to die and rise again. He said that verbatim. If they'd known the scriptures, they would have then connected Isaiah 53 with what Jesus had said and went, okay, this is what's going down. They should have known. It's disappointing to see that come Sunday morning, they're not like, hey, it's Sunday, it's three days, let's go. Jesus has got to be out of the tomb by now. Let's run down there and go get him. But they weren't running to go get him. The women were bringing spices to properly bury him. He had been hurriedly buried. They just did a little bit to clean him up, a little bit to wrap him in a shroud, put him in the tomb before the sun went down, and the beginning of a Passover connected to the Feast of the Unleavened Bread began. So what they normally did with the dead, they were going to wait until Sunday morning when he was supposed to rise from the dead, says Jesus. And yet, why don't they believe it? They'd even seen Lazarus risen from the dead. That was just a week and a half ago. But what they saw was so out of the expectation for them. What they saw so traumatized them that they, they just didn't think, they just didn't believe. They saw their friend, their leader, taken down from a cross, and I'm sure he was a bloody mess, horrible to look at. And they mourned the whole week, weekend. And then they came not expecting anything. So in the reading that we had, 
It talks about an angel being there and telling them, hey, Jesus is gone. In another reading of the gospel, they, they don't talk about an angel. They encounter Jesus, and they think it's a gardener. And they ask the gardener, where have you put him? Now, why would you, why would you even think that, right? If you're a gar- is that what a gardener in a cemetery does? Walk around grabbing bodies, moving them back and forth to mess with people? Is that what they do? Uh, that's not even a plausible theory. They thought the body was stolen. They couldn't believe he was alive. That's all they thought. They needed to be schooled. They needed to have their eyes opened. And when they saw him, they said, Rabboni. And they wanted to hug him. But he says, no, it's not time for that yet. I'll see you in Galilee. It took a while for that group of people even though they followed him for basically three years, to understand fully what Jesus' mission was and that it had been accomplished. We are lucky from the standpoint that we're well back from it historically. We have gotten the full insight from the Holy Spirit. We know that this was planned all along. It was planned before there was a problem to even fix. Through all of the Old Testament, God dropped hint after hint after hint after hint that this is what he was going to do. And now he had done it. He had fulfilled the law. He had paid the price. And as Isaiah's passage says, if you look at it, it says, he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that's cast over all peoples the veil that spread over all nations. What's that veil? He will swallow up death forever. It's hard to appreciate, but I think you got to try. You're a human being. From the time you were conceived, you were already not the way God designed you to be. You were messed up. Even as a kid, you did things that were contrary to what God wanted. And as a teenager, you, you remember that you did things that God didn't want. Today, if you're adult, hopefully you're well aware that sin is part of you. And the consequence of sin is not light. You're cast off from God forever unless something takes it away. And that's what Jesus has done. And that's why you should be excited. You are going to go to hell. You are going to go to heaven. Jesus has taken away a leverage that Satan was using against you. He was saying, you said in the law that sin has to be judged and you're going to judge me then you have to judge them and God doesn't want to throw us away and so he did what he did and he's provided eternal life and here's the one more hindsight that you need to achieve so we got a hindsight right on Jesus' death and that part of Isaiah 25 but what about the other part this part The first part, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, rich food full of marrow and aged wine well-refined. What's he talking about? He's getting, he's trying to use words that people can relate to, to understand the kind of place that God has prepared for us. He's got to use words that kind of fit into our experience because there just isn't words to really grasp the glory of what heaven will be like, of what the resurrection will be like, of what the new earth will be like. And so he likens it to the very best of what the people had at the time of Isaiah. A big party with lots of food and lots of wine. And that is exactly 
and more what God has prepared for us. Don't ever think of heaven as a consolation prize. Don't ever think of it as some long, extremely boring thing. It is going to be an adventure. It is going to be a party. It's going to be a joy. The things that make this life tough are going to be all gone. That's why he says, I'm going to wipe away the tears from all faces. I'm going to take away the reproach of my people. And when you're there, just like we say, he is risen, he is risen indeed, we will say something like this. We'll say, behold, this is our God. We waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And you will definitely say it then. But I hope you say it now. That you are already confident because God is good. Because this story of Jesus isn't a story, it's history. And his promise to you is good as gold. And there's people that you know and love who've already gone there who are having a blast. And you have to wait your time. You have some work to do. But you have a place already set aside for you. Behold, rejoice in his salvation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's confess that we do believe using the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand for that confession. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our offering is something that we do because we want to honor God and participate in the work of the kingdom. If you're a visitor today, we certainly don't expect an offering for you from you. Uh, our people know that they can give at the door or give electronically, but let us give out of thanksgiving to God. We go now and join in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you this day. We know where our life is going. We know that we have, because of Christ, a place that is beyond the difficulties of this life, beyond sin, beyond the curse, beyond the weakness that we feel in our flesh this day. We will see you face to face. We will love one another. We will experience the full scope of the glory of your creation and your creativity. And that can be only begin soon enough. But for now, Lord, strengthen us that, that we might serve you. Let us do it in full faith, 
Strengthen where we are weak. Make us confident where we doubt. Heavenly Father, this day, we do give you praise for that, this and, and other blessings. We thank you for a little girl whom we've been praying for who had a brain tumor. And now the report is all clear. And we praise you for Maddie's results. We praise you for going with Russell through a procedure that was successful. And we praise you for the strength that we find even in the midst of our weaknesses. We pray that you bring blessing to Landis and improve her symptoms. We ask that you would uphold Bryce in an, in an advancing early dementia, that you would call him home or make him better. Lord, we pray for Andy and for Ken, for the strength that they need against an illness that's pulling them down, for Keith and Nancy and Barbara, who are nearing the end of life and receiving hospice care, for Irwin and Anne and Lisa and others who struggle with cancer, for Barb and Beth and Rose and Carly who struggle with mental health. Give them, give them what they need to find joy and purpose in life, to deal with the world as it should be dealt, and find comfort in you, O Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for Keith in his search for housing, for Caden and Kaylee in their desire to stay um, where they are right now rather than go home. And Heavenly Father, we pray for everyone who lives in war zones, who are persecuted because of their faith, who face places where the gospel is, is not there for them to hear. Strengthen them, O oh Lord. Give them opportunities. Change their situations. And we know that you can do it. That's why we ask you. And we trust that you will do what's right. And we pray in the name of Jesus, who's also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially, we are bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and who bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. By his rising again, he has restored us to everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Oh.
Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took a cup after supper. When he'd given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament of my blood, which is given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
these words and these words are different. Are we supposed to change any words? You have received the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes you one with him, that you can have eternal life. 
Go now with his blessing and his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please stand.